Thank you for inviting us into your home or wherever you may be. We've, we're in a powerful series. I have loved this and it's awesome what the Lord's doing. And so we entitled it, When Revival Comes. And I just posed that is what will you do when revival comes? It's easy to miss God during a time of God's powerful moving. So we've been learning a lot of things and we're gonna continue. But today I wanna talk about moving beyond offense. How many of you are ready to move beyond the offenses that have been brought in your life? Well, we can move beyond those. And so I want us to go back to Hosea chapter 10, verse 12. We've read that several times. Hosea chapter 10, verse 12. And you remember when Jesus spoke, often he would go, if any man have ears to hear, if any man have ears to hear. And I thought about that one time and all of a sudden it occurred to me that I'll guarantee you 99.9% .9 of those people had these little pieces of flesh on the sides of the head called ears. That wasn't what he was talking about. There are ears in your heart, so to speak. There are things that go down into your heart and depending what you let go into your heart is gonna depend on what you believe. And what you believe will determine what you become. And so that's why truth is such a precious, valuable commodity to where it says in the word, buy truth. Don't sell it. If you buy something, that means it costs you. So the enemy's in the world of manipulation and deception. Sun Tzu said, all warfare is deception. It all lies in the communications. So let's read this scripture. There's just a few things I wanna cover with you today. Moving beyond offense. Hosea chapter 10, verse 12 says, sow for yourselves righteousness. Quit waiting on somebody else to come bring your ship in. Sow for yourselves, righteousness, reap in mercy. I want mercy, not judgment. Do you know by bowing your knee to the Lord Jesus willingly now will save you from an eternity separated from God forevermore in eternal torment? In other words, once you die, you can't get saved after you leave this earth. And all they would have had to do was just, all a person would have to do is accept, receive God's forgiveness, repent, turn, go the other direction. Actually, Marilyn and Linda and I were talking <clears throat> and she just heard something in one of these messages. So that, that's her other set of ears that she's hearing. Has anybody ever heard your voice on a cassette or a cassette? <laughs> Y'all want to guess how old I am? <laughs> we still say it today. Just go back to our tape table. <laughs> there are no tapes. Anyway, you ever heard your recorded voice and go, that's not me? You ever heard that? Do I sound like that? I remember the first time I ever heard my voice, I was like, gee, it's horrible. Why does it sound like that? Because when I hear your voice on a recorder, it sounds just like you because you have two sets of ears. You have a set of inner ears that go right into your heart and you have these ears right here. How many had a discussion with your children? You're not hearing what I'm saying. <laughs> Has anybody ever had children that have selective hearing loss? <laughs> Guess what? Us adults have selective hearing loss. But the reason you, you don't sound like you think you should, because you're hearing yourself with your inner ear. We hear it with our outer ear, it captures the sound. So the words out of your own mouth will go into your heart, register deeper and more powerfully than anybody else's words. Most people's undoing is their own mouth. When you say something and the devil loves to get a hold of your tongue because he can bind you up by your own words. 
By thy words, you shall be justified and by your words, you shall be condemned. Most people don't know it. <clears throat> they are in a subconscious flow and a subconscious stream of words that continually bind them because you will never rise above the level of your confession of faith. You can't. Life is voice activated. I used to get people get mad at me for saying that, but it was before we had smartphones and tablets and all that kind of stuff. This is such a good illustration now. You ever been driving down the road? I used to have a car and it would go, say a command. One time I almost went through the sunroof when I heard that. I accidentally discovered there was voice activation on that car. <laughs> say a command. It just boom. And there's times this phone will talk to me and I was not talking to the phone, but it thought I was. This thing's listening all the time. Well, let me just tell you, the spiritual world never turns off. The battery never goes off. It is always listening and there are demons and angels waiting for license to perform whatever you say. And then most Christians are trying to figure out why God doesn't do something. I'll tell you why. Because of our big blab mouth, that's why. Jericho, what was the command? All right, Joshua, get them around, march around the walls of Jericho and don't say anything for the first seven days. That is one of the greatest miracles right there. <laughs> that everybody kept their mouth shut. Because most of the time they'd be going, what are we doing? This is pretty stupid. We're kind of vulnerable. They could just go right up off the top and start raining down on us. The Lord said, don't say anything. There are so many instances, the power of death and life are in the tongue. That means the jurisdiction in the tongue. So three things, let's get into this. Number one, unbelief is evidence of a hard heart. Unbelief is the evidence of a hard heart. That is not a condemning statement, but I will promise you, some of you just heard me in a condemning tone because of the programming in your heart and the wounds that aren't healed yet. Same with me. People can say something and I kind of draw back. And then all of a sudden I have to back up and go, Mark, you need to uh, clear some things out of your heart. So unbelief is evidence of a hard heart. So for revival, for you to be a part of what's God done, because revival honestly doesn't start out there, it starts in here. It's the happenings within that are causing so many believers trouble, not the happenings without. The happenings within. Most believers are their own worst enemy called sabotage. We sabotage our own lives. So he says, sow for yourselves righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground. What is fallow ground? It's ground that hadn't been tilled and, 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 and broken up. So there's two things going on. One, the ground when it goes fallow is getting rich and resting, but it also bears thorns and thistles. So you have to go in and break it up. You have to plow it up. In order for the seed, so many Christians sit in church and hear the word taught and it's like tossing seed on asphalt. Never gets down in the heart. Because I'm telling you, you get the word in your heart and you nurture it and water it and tend to it and care for it, you will start seeing God kind of results. Thank you for that. Just incredible, overwhelming <laughs> excitement there. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word, what? Was God. God and His Word are one and the same. So the Lord says, I put in written format, that Bible you hold is not a book like any other book. It is the Word of God. How He does it, I don't know, but it sure is awesome. But you have to read the Bible first of all, Two, you must study the Bible. Everything I'm telling you is scriptural. And then number three, till it gets into meditation, you most likely won't see what it's meant to do in your life. If you could take the time, 
that you spend on worry, fear, anxiety, anger, revenge, and put the word in there, do you know what you would be? You'd be a bona fide giant killer. You would be taking Goliath down. You'd be walking all over the enemy. You would tread satanic forces under your feet. You'd be the devil's worst nightmare. You'd wake up in the morning, the devil would have a fit. You have, you and I, I'm talking to me as well, we have to be hurt, wounded, betrayed, kicked, spit on, abused, violated in order to be locked into a life of unbelief. You know why? Children are born believers. Are you with me? Do you follow me that? Children are born believers. Got to hang out yesterday with Clara and Caroline. And what was so neat, you know, you just stare at them and just, just it warms your heart. It's so refreshing, the innocence of a child. And you know, Clara's a believer. She'll believe whatever you tell her. Anything. And so we're born that way. People that don't believe in God, I'll tell you what happened. They had, most likely, irreconcilable happenings and occurrences in their life. And the enemy comes in on that and said, if there was a God, that would not have happened to you. And the thing that factors in is we have to remember is that we are on a battlefield. So we have forces that we deal with. They're called demonic powers. And depending on your upbringing and what you were born into you, some of you were born into some very, very bad situations. That's just the enemy's way to tag, tag you early on. The earlier he can get you, the more he can mess you up. Andre Bronkhorst is a friend of ours. He's powerful prophetic gifting. And I was listening to something that he had spoken here recently. And he said in there, he was ministering in a meeting and all these demonic manifestations were happening. All these demonic powers were coming through people. And he said, all of a sudden the Lord said, Andre, you are not here to deliver people from devils, but the hold that other people have on them. People have controlled one another because of fear and insecurity. Unhealthy relationships and soul ties will keep you from your destiny. There are some people alive today, even Christians, who are being controlled by people that are in the grave. The perpetrator, the violator's gone, but the stronghold is still there. I was in my office back there and I ran onto that skillet that I had. So we had uh, Bill Kazmeyer here and Dennis Rogers. A lot of you know the Kaz, they call him. And so he, from what I understand, has set world records strength-wise that still haven't been broken. But Dennis Rogers is the strongest man in the world, pound for pound, 160 pounds. They can bend crescent wrenches, roll skillets up. It is just crazy. I think Dennis has a third tendon or something. It's really crazy. But Bill Kazmaier was here and him and Dennis each had a skillet. This is a long time ago. I came around the corner and he's standing. He's an optical illusion. Got a hand like a catcher's mitt. Please don't squeeze. <laughs> so he took a skillet and they, and they start rolling these skillets up. So... We kept the skillet. So for an, that's, I don't do much in illustrated sermons, but I bring a skillet out and I hold it up. And the one that he rolled up looks like a burrito. Looks like you just went down to Chipotle. I mean, he just rolled that thing up. So I, I hold it up and I say, what is this? And everybody's like, it's a skillet. And then I hold this one up and I go, what is it? They're kind of looking, I go, it's a skillet too but it has a stronghold on it. The strong man's gone. He's nowhere around, but the stronghold and the evidence is still there. And that's many believers. When you fail to forgive, you create a 
unholy tie between the person that has hurt you, dead or alive, because the offense lives. But your spiritual DNA being born again is to love people. You have agape love, the God kind of love on the inside of you. But life's wounds can be so painful and deep that most people live and die and never break up the fallow ground to allow what God has to enter into them. So you've heard this, in life pain is inevitable but misery is optional. You can literally take what's happened to you instead of it being your tombstone or a stumbling block, you can turn it into a stepping stone. It's like people that invent things or do, I think it was Thomas Edison, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of failures on the light bulb. And they're like, aren't you gonna quit? I mean, you failed so many times. He says, are you kidding me? I'm hundreds of times closer to finding a way it works. Dr. Summerall used to say that. I don't fail. I just found a whole lot of ways that don't work. If we would just get a paradigm shift in how we see things and start seeing things the way God is, your life is a mess, guess what? God brings messages out of messes. If you look at how message is spelled, the first part of the word is mess. There's so much garbage in my life. You don't understand. Garbage makes awesome fertilizer. And that's, that's what, if most people will allow God to have his way in their life, they could go to heights that are unbelievable. I was in New Zealand one time, and that is one of the most beautiful places on the earth. It is gorgeous. Blue water, white sands. So our host took us down to the place where all the yachts are and where the big ships come in. So we're sitting there and I go, good Lord, I've never seen ocean going things like this. Well, they were these mega yachts. And he started saying, this belongs to this billionaire and this belongs to that billionaire. I mean, it was incredible. But you know, the Lord started speaking to my heart. They were tied up to the dock. Those, have you ever seen those shows where they go through the mega yachts and what they have? They have swimming pools on board, helicopter pads, weight rooms. I mean, it is opulence that you cannot imagine. But those ocean going vessels weren't going anywhere. They were stuck in the harbor until somebody untied them and unhooked them. And many people will not fulfill their destiny because they're tied to the shore in the shallows of the harbor through unforgiveness. Even having a paradigm shift in forgiving people which men, I wanna tell you about this meeting we're gonna have with Ivan Tate, not this Friday, but the next Friday. Ivan Tate's gonna be with us and you men need to come. I'm telling you, the Lord is stirring my heart about the men, you men. We need to be together. We, we hide too much, we withdraw too much, we need each other, men. And the world, and, and Ivan walks this stuff that we talk about when it comes to forgiveness and an orphan spirit. When you hear his story of, horrible relationship with his dad. And he made a vow he would never shed a tear for his dad. Says when he dies, I will not cry. I will not go to his funeral. And then he got saved at 17. He totally changed. I love Ivan. He's one of my favorite people to talk to because he's so very real. And he walks in it. He's always in touch with God and having communion and fresh manna. There's so much phoniness in the ministry. There's so much garbage in the ministry. I am in certain places out in the marketplace with unsaved people at times. And I've told some of them, there are some of my preacher friends I do not want you to meet. I don't want you to know them. They embarrass all of us. The world sees through that stuff. It's time to be free. Amen. All of us. Time to be free. He whom the sun sets free is free indeed. The world is more ready for the gospel than we're ready to give it to them. So that's 
Why? Go to Matthew 17, verse 18. So this devil, this demon would not come out of a child. And in Matthew 17, verse 18, this man came and said, please help my son. And in verse 18, it says, Jesus rebuked the devil and he departed out of him and the child was cured from that very hour. Then in verse 19, then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, why could we not cast him out? Now look in verse 20, here is gonna be a major key to every one of our lives. Look at verse 20. Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you'll say to this mountain. I've had people say, I don't have enough faith. That is not scriptural. Anybody born again, you have all the faith you'll ever need in your life. It's just, are you gonna develop it? You're not using what you have. And America is too easy of a place to not use your faith. Go to the doctor, go to the counselor, go to this, go to the bank, go to that. But in other parts of the world, they don't have all this. But in America, we can get where we quit using our faith. And when you don't use it, you lose it. There was a time I, I loved lifting weights and, and working out. And I told you the story of this friend that I had that I was so skinny back then. Kind of look back fondly on those days. <laughs> you know, and then you start fulfilling the role of a pastor if you don't watch what you eat. But there was this guy and his name was Tom Platts. He had the biggest thighs in the world of muscle. Huge dude. And he was in one of those strongman contests. So they're having races with refrigerators on their back. So they're running with the refrigerators and he falls and he breaks his leg. So then it goes in a cast, which means that what? Immobilizes his leg. And he can't use his leg. And they were there when they took the cast off in the doctor's office. And I mean, his one leg is just so huge and muscular, but his other leg in six weeks, why it looked like my leg, just, and that's what's happened to some people. You're not using your faith anymore. Now what the Lord's doing is we have no choice, America, we have no choice, church. We're gonna have to start using our faith again. We can't just go elect somebody, hit a snooze button and hope everything's gonna be okay. We have an enemy, not at our door, in our midst, in our ranks. We've been infiltrated. Ooh, I'm ready for war. Are you ready for war yet? Ah, I, I feel fire inside me. The spirit that birthed our country, this country is in such pathetic shape thanks to the church. Here by permission of the church. But your DNA is warrior. You're a warrior because the Lord is a warrior. The Bible says the Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Unbelief Charles Spurgeon said, we'll destroy the best of us, faith will save the worst of us. Unbelief will destroy the best of us and faith will save the worst of us. But unbelief is a socially acceptable sin in the body of Christ because temperature does matter in the church. Most of the church at large is lukewarm. What is it? A little bit of hot, a little bit of cold. So we can fit in with the world. We can fit in with the church. But temperature matters with God because Jesus said to Laodicea, I know your works. And he said, you're neither hot nor cold. And Jesus said, I'd rather have you hot or cold. And because you are what? Lukewarm? Temperature matters. I will vomit you out of my mouth. Vomit. 
You can't vomit anything that hasn't been in you. That was his church and he was on the outside trying to get back in to his church. That's where the Lord is in America right now. The Lord is knocking on the door of his church, asking if he will be invited back in. And many are saying, no, thank you, Lord. We have our own program. Right now is just simply sifting, refining, and separation going on. Not just the sheep from the goats, but the sheep from the sheep. That's the truth. There's a whole lot of people that thought they were ready for war and they're not. So many believers are misunderstanding what's going on in their lives because God planted you, but some thought they were buried. And it is a fact, seeds have to die. Seeds get covered up. Seeds get put in dark places. But if you don't get planted, your destiny will never be released in your life. Second thing we wanna look at, go to Mark 16, verse four. The second thing I was meditating on, it's time to declare war in our unbelief. It's actually past time. Remember we did a series on that, declaring war in our unbelief. It's past time. We tolerate too much. I'm talking to me as much as I am you. Just remember when I point a finger at you, I have three coming back at me. We've tolerated unbelief too much. Mark chapter 16, verse 14, afterward he appeared unto the 11 as they sat at meat and he upbraided them. He rebuked them with their unbelief and hardness of heart. There you see right there. Hardness of heart is what constitutes the atmosphere for unbelief because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. And he said unto them, go into all the world. So we have to declare war on unbelief. It is a war in our lives. Unbelief is akin to atheism, Spurgeon said. Atheism denies God's existence while unbelief denies his goodness. Boy, that's an ouch. So in the Christian life, in fact, um, it was somebody sitting right over here, Larry. You told me one day after church, I've still been meditating on this. You pulled out that old book uh, on Heinz feet or something like that. One thing you said, I'm still chewing on. In there it said, too much of the time we're fighting for God instead of with God. We're out in battles, wearing ourselves out when the battle's already won. As they say, that will preach. God doesn't need you fighting for him. Well, what fight are you supposed to be in? The good fight of faith. Fight the good fight of faith. You don't need to fight the devil. He's defeated. That will always stir up Pharisees, that statement right there. What do you mean the devil is defeated? Just go read your headlines. Look out there in the world. I'm telling you the devil in Christ is a defeated foe. Nowhere does the Bible tell you to go fight the devil. He says, go cast him out. Fight the good fight of faith. So I came up with kind of a ridiculous illustration, but it gets the point across. So suppose there had been a very bad criminal and the police come, and let's say this criminal was shot by the police at the scene of the crime and he dies right there. So they call the coroner and they load the dead body up into the coroner's vehicle. And let's suppose the coroner gets in there and drives away to take the body to the morgue and let's suppose the body falls out into the street and they're still taking off. And suppose everybody that witnessed the crime runs over there and starts beating that corpse and pounding that thing so it won't do anything else to anybody. Ridiculous, but it gets the point. The devil is a defeated foe. And the greater that you get into faith, the greater you know that. Wigglesworth had revelation of that because of his faith. He was an illiterate plumber 
in England. He was one of those that was a disaster when he got up to speak until the anointing fell on him. But one night there was a violent storm and he heard something in his living room and he got his lamp and he got up and he went in there and there was a manifestation of a demon. And he looked up and he goes, oh, just you. Went back to bed. Lester Summerall, this is a true story. Put it back. He was in Philippines, all the witch doctors sending their curses. And all of a sudden one night he's in his room and this horrible stench comes in, horrible. You know, there are smells in the spirit. Just like a sweet fragrance of kais, there's demonic things that you can smell. And all of a sudden this stench came in there and the bed starts shaking violently while he's in the bed, shook the bed away from the wall. And all of a sudden he said, in the name of Jesus, I command you out of here. And the bed stopped and the smell left. And <laughs> Lester, being the feisty little Irishman he was, he said, you know, when I went to bed tonight, this bed was against the wall. And that devil came in here and moved my bed. He said, devil, get back in this room. And this stench came back in the room. The bed started shaking and it went back up against the wall. He said, now get out of here. That's the kind of command you need to be exercising over the stinking devil in your life. And the spirit of faith in you will do that. There's a new you you need to be introduced to. And how do we do that? Third and the final thing, you need to stir the gift up. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6. So listen to this, Spurgeon said this too. He said, unbelief is the mother of vice, the parent of sin, and therefore I say, it is a pestilent evil, a master sin. I believe at the root of all sin and disobedience is a spirit of unbelief. Because if you believe, truly believed, everything God said about you and over you, you would not even be tempted by most of what you're battling right now. Why would you stoop down with all of the things that God has for you? But Paul told Timothy, 2 Timothy 1 verse six, therefore I remind you to stir up the gift of God. It literally means to fan into flames, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound disciplined mind. So let me close up on these things here. Remember this, frustration is necessary to bear fruit. It's kind of counterintuitive because we seek to alleviate our frustration. Most of the time it's the wrong way. Welcome the frustration and then say, okay, now I'm gonna find out how God wants me to do this. Struggle is absolutely essential in developing strength and transformation requires sacrifice. We've had a cheap grace and cheap gospel peddled to us that you can get something for nothing. Well, in the context of salvation, you can't buy it, it's yours, it's purchased, but it's gonna cost you everything, cost me everything. Blessings from heaven don't come cheap. It's not earning, it's dealing with our flesh and the obstacles. Struggle is essential in developing the strength. Your struggle is where your strength comes from. Like the little baby chick in those eggs. So the little baby chick is in that comfortable, warm environment. For a season, that is the safety for the baby chick in there. But all of a sudden, what has been its safety, something says it's time to break out and go to a new environment. And that little baby chick, laws of nature, nature's God, begins the fight of its life. And it starts pecking away and pecking away. They say it comes to the point of exhaustion and almost death before it breaks out. And guess what happens? If you help it, they often die. That little baby chick breaking out of that restraining force now, the very thing that has now become a detriment to it, 
The strength that it's gonna need to survive its new environment is in the struggle. So the fight of faith that you're in right now, the fight you're going through right now of faith is preparing you for the new world God has for you. That's good. God's got awesome things. That's what's going on in America right now. Many Christians are letting things control them that have no power except what that believer gives over them. That's why the Bible asks, tells us, commands us to repent, not just pray a prayer to receive Christ. It's repent, change. I'm looking out over here. I see a lot of miracles sitting in here. Whatever you're going through right now, I promise you somebody's already been there and gone through it and way down the road, and you can too, but it's a fight. It's fighting the good fight of faith, not people. Don't fight the devil. One man of God, he was a spiritual father in my life at the very beginning, the Lord told him to go to a bullfight when he was in Mexico. He said, Lord, I don't wanna go there and watch them torment that animal. I hate that stuff. Kept saying, go down there and he watched and the Lord spoke to him. He said, all of a sudden out <laughs> walks this 150 pound little matador, as this man would say, strutting like a banny rooster. And he has a red cape and they open that gate up and out comes a 15, 1600 pound, pound raging bull with horns and he proceeds to get into it with that thing. And all of a sudden while he was there, the Lord said, there's where the church is today, right now. The church is chasing red flags, fighting the devil, doing this, doing that. If we would fight the good fight of faith, faith is the victory that overcomes the world. So I wanna encourage you in breaking up the fallow ground, it's just getting rid of the thorns and the thistles and the weeds in your life. And it begins with repentance to say, okay, God, I'm drawing a line in the sand. I'm giving you my life. I'm gonna make a quality decision to follow you. And a quality decision is one that says, I will not retreat. I am going to give my life to you. I want us to pray right now, let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, anybody here online or at Southwest Campus that has never made that decision, Lord, I pray today that'll be their day. God's dealing with hearts. I don't have to see you, know you, God does. And it's acknowledgement of the heart. If you've never been saved, I'm gonna lead you in this prayer. If you have been saved and God had has room in your life, make this a prayer of, re, of dedication, rededication to your life to say, God, because wherever you're at, God is willing to work with you on the grounds of faith. That's the way he works with us. It's his way, not our way. You cannot have it your way. It's his way. And if that's you, I want you to follow me in this prayer this morning. We're gonna all pray it out loud. Lord Jesus, I receive you as my savior and I make you Lord of my life. And I thank you that I'm saved. I give you my all in Jesus name, amen. Praise the Lord. Let's give the Lord a praise this morning.